And Glenn Maguire, economist at ANZ Singapore, he joins us on the show right now. Glenn, hi, morning. Crude quite clearly has become a major cause of concern as tensions in Iraq escalate now. Uh, what's the sense, uh, sense that you're getting? Do you think this spike up would continue for many more weeks ahead? It possibly could, and I think it's important when we look at the tensions in Iraq that not only are we looking at an uneven global economic recovery, we're looking at an uneven distribution of political power, which is something the world hasn't seen in quite a while. Uh, so we have China asserting itself in the, in the seas, its territorial waters. Uh, we have Russia and the Ukraine. We have the waning U.S. influence. Now we have developments in Iraq. It's very much a multipolar uh, political dynamic that we're looking at. And uh, with no clear resolution to that, it's probably likely to continue to add to risk off uh, volatility going forward. But at this stage, it's probably too early to, uh, to sort of put definitive forecasts on how Iraq is likely to evolve. Uh, but it's certainly something to monitor from a risk perspective. Glenn, but if I look at the global energy situation or the global energy demand, uh, demand is supply is more than demand. Uh, world has discovered shale gas. Uh, the global consumer is still not spending, which means in the near term, geopolitical concerns could fare crude prices, but ultimately demand and supply dynamics have to catch up, and those dynamics are favorable in, uh, in uh, favor of supply, not in favor of demand. Yes, I mean, ultimately you would expect the price to fall as a result of that. Um, I think one of the key, and the, I think the key development we need to focus on is where global demand is emerging. And we're all aware that China is slowing, that the emerging markets are slowing with that. The US is recovering, Europe is recovering, and Japan is recovering. And those three economies are much more efficient users uh, of oil and energy than the emerging markets. So growth in the global economy is rotating to more efficient users of energy. And again, that would be supportive in terms of the supply-demand balance uh, of prices generally declining. Glenn, what's your view then on uh, the macro data coming out of India, the IIP as well as the CPI print uh, coming in? Quite a turnaround from the stagflationary trends that we were earlier seeing. Well, we like to describe India as being in a sweet spot at the moment. Compared to some other economies, you're starting to see activity pick up and the disinflation glide path continue. Uh, and if that trend continues, then, um, you know, the current monetary policy settings may need to be revisited, and that's certainly something RBI Governor Rajan has suggested. But I think what we're likely to see is uh, India is going to continue to enjoy the benefits of uh, lagged currency depreciation, supporting exports. There probably is likely to be some Modi effect, which boosts business confidence, so investment comes online. Uh, and I think, you know, we can clearly say that India has troughed uh, and the prospects from here are rising growth, uh, perhaps around the volatile trend uh, into 15 and 16. Mm. Glenn, I'm with you when you say that India has bottomed out and maybe worst of the economic print is behind us. But is it too early to assume that the uptick has started? So we may have a bottom in place, but the V-shaped recovery is not started. Well, I wouldn't exactly expect it to be a V-shaped recovery. I mean, policy, tight, policy remains very, very tight in terms of monetary policy and delayed fiscal policy. So I think it's going to be more of a U-shaped recovery and quite slow in its unfolding. And there could be some downside data surprises on the way. Um, but definitely we wouldn't be looking for a sharp V-shaped recovery, particularly given how tight monetary policy is. Uh, so the risk is sentiment may cool on India if the data returns to being a little bit more mixed, uh, which we think it could. Mm. Glenn, uh, after a, a tectonic uh, shift in the election mandate, do you think the India rhetoric has changed? And now Indian economy and Indian markets are likely to get re-rated because what we've seen is a massive uh, re-rating in emerging market equities. But do you think Indian markets within that uh, re-rating will benefit the most? I think it could for two reasons. One, 
the political cycle in India tends to be five years. So what you tend to see is in the first three years, difficult and needed reforms are implemented in the, and then in the final two years you tend to have sort of a political stalemate in the lead up to elections. So the first point is uh, the fact that, you know, it's five years to another election, some difficult and much needed reforms may be undertaken. That would be positive and see a re-rating to, to India. The other is that when we look at the twin deficit economies in Asia, India and Indonesia, uh, we think Indonesia may be more at risk of a current account deficit widening and of uh, a fiscal deficit widening in the second half of this year and into 15. And as we get closer to um, uh, the Fed actually moving to raise rates, then Indonesia could perhaps uh, see a repeat of the taper tantrum dynamics of 2013. Uh, we'd expect India uh, to be relatively immune given its current uh, economic situation.